Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. So whatever about paying, you can give blood in Ireland three times a year or four times. And I think in the States, maybe six. So you can help other people and highly likely uh, improve your own health with the one intervention. I mean, what's not to like? Absolutely. Um, The thing is, is that a a large number of people are ineligible to donate blood. Um, So I don't don't know what the figures are. Uh, They they say that the the Red Cross has a figure like only 5% of people donate blood. And I'm not sure if that's uh, compared to everyone or or only 5% of the eligible people. But nevertheless, uh, there's some... I I believe over half of the adult population is ineligible for one reason or another to give blood. You have to be a healthy person um, and and they have a lot of uh, hurdles to to, uh, jump. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. So therapeutic phlebotomy would be a nice option. I, I've had a, a lot of people ask me, well, um, you know, how do, how do I get a therapeutic phlebotomy? I, I just want to get rid of some blood, you know, and I'm in, ineligible to donate. And this, we're talking about, say, you know, a normal age, normal middle-aged man or woman. I just want to get rid of some blood, but I can't donate. Or, you know, people are too busy. That you know, they, they would love to be able to pop into the doctor's office and and get rid of a pint of blood, whereas the blood donation process is a is a little lengthier. But unfortunately, uh, there there are just no good options. The number of doctors who are willing to perform it for an otherwise healthy person with with a ferritin level that is not just sky high is very very few. Yeah, I'd I'd agree, and I, I I often made the joke with people about you know well, Google it and find out how to find a a, a vein. You know, we're not we are not we are not recommending that here. That was a joke, um, or find your local your local drug dealer might be able to help you out with with finding one, but uh, yeah, it, it's a pity. Um, but in fairness, if it's not acknowledged in the established medical canon or medical science. You could understand the reluctance to do what to a doctor would appear to be quackery, um, having not looked or seen any of the science. So it's fair enough. Uh, But I, interestingly, on another uh, angle on the iron, when I researched it for a few weeks, like I said, I was quite frankly shocked because I saw all the correlations, mortality, cardiovascular disease. I could not believe how problematic high ferritin was in associational data and the mechanisms were beautiful i mean i just buried myself in them but i found one night i predicted uh because in engineering you always try and predict uh, uh, make a hypothesis that can be tested you know if you're a root cause specialist like i was you always try and make the best hypothesis and you try and test it and when you actually test it and it, it works it's like whoopee But I was looking for papers on metabolic and insulin resistance syndrome. And I knew from my research on iron and ferritin and from my research on hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, I knew that iron and ferritin should link to the insulin resistance syndrome 
it kind of had to from the way my research was going because I was following certain paths and I could see where they should intersect. And funnily, one night, it was a Tuesday night, I remember, and my wife was thinking, Ivor's gone crazy. Like every night he comes home from work and he's in there looking at these papers, mountains of papers printed out. And then I found it and it was basically a Chinese study and it said, the title practically said that elevated ferritin should be the sixth marker for metabolic syndrome. And I went running out of the room. Yes, I knew it. <laughs> and the, the yes. quartiles of ferritin against metabolic syndrome components were just stunning. So I guess the point, though, that then arose was ferritin can be causal in excess through many mechanisms but also ferritin elevates in inflammatory conditions like metabolic syndrome and even people with lupus or arthritis kind of really high ferritin so this whole iron interaction is so complex and it can be an indicator and a, a, a reactant to infl inflammatory pressure so it can be both a sign a, and a driver of problems so maybe we talk a little about that yes absolutely there, there's there's sort of a, when you're talking about elevated ferritin and things like uh, metabolic syndrome or diabetes, there is a chicken or chicken or egg problem here. Um, wh which came first? What's causing what? Um, what is, on the one hand, what appears to be happening is that when someone has metabolic syndrome, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the system is, is screwed up, right? So the iron, the, the system that regulates iron absorption is screwed up um, and they could absorb more iron. Another thing going on is then when you have this ferritin, so you've read my book and you know I use this metaphor in my book about ferritin. It's like stored dynamite. So mm -hmm. if you have a bunch of dynamite in a crate it's reason it's it's supposed to be safe there's you know there's nothing there you know but you don't really want to have a crate of dynamite in your house accidents happen and so with ferritin what happens is ferritin itself that's the safe form of iron but the iron gets out of it so in in and then when the iron gets out of it the the atomic iron and it reacts with um, all these other molecules in the body causes oxidative stress. It oxidizes LDL. It oxidizes the cellular proteins and cellular membranes. And that's what exactly what you don't want to have happen. In, in Alzheimer's disease, for example, there there appears to be not it's not ferritin as such that's causing the problem, but it's free iron in the brain. That so for some reason the body and the brain are unable to keep that iron safely locked away in ferritin and it goes out into the brain and causes all these problems. And as you know, Alzheimer's disease is called, often referred to as type three diabetes. So there you have a connection where you've got this insulin resistance syndrome in the brain and then you've got this free iron causing problems. Which came first? Well that's hard to say but what what appears to happen in metabolic syndrome and diabetes is that high high blood sugar as you know uh, causes glucose glucose linking to proteins and other molecules in the body and renders them dysfunctional or non-functional and what appears to be happening is that ferritin itself is is subject to this attack by glucose when blood glucose goes very high. So somebody who has, has a high blood glu glucose is more likely to have this glycosylated ferritin. The ferritin is then no longer able to hold the iron within it and it gets out and causing these oxidation reactions. So as you say, it is very complex. There are several things going on here, many things going on here. And it, it does appear by my reading that elevated ferritin alone can cause these problems but then on the other hand metabolic syndrome can lead to elevated ferritin with 
lots of free iron in the system causing all these problems. Yeah, so essentially in a way it it's it may be slightly like insulin itself and and hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. It's got insulin resistance the state has causal pathways, myriad causal pathways to actually damage the body, but insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia also act as a really good gauge of another damaging process that it reacts and rises in response to, like infection, smoking, your insulin resistance rises in response to many insults that in turn cause damage to your vasculature. So similarly, the raised ferritin may, being high may be bad for many different reasons. Uh, mine actually, I, I projected that when I switched to a low carb, healthy fats diet, that my metrics would get better. And I expected because of the metabolic syndrome that the ferritin would too, and certainly the GGT. What happened in seven or eight weeks was the ferritin went from 530 to I think 220. The GGT went from 115 down to in eight weeks or nine weeks, uh, the high 20s. And my cholesterol ratios all dramatically got better. So it was very pleasing to see that every marker I researched went exactly where it ought to go based on switching the diet and fixing the root causes. But there seems to be people with high ferritin who do not have much disease. So I wonder, and I've wondered this for a couple of years, and recently we did calcification scans on 55 sportsmen, and we had all their bloods and all their scan results, and they were zero up to 3,200. You know, these were... Fa famous sporting players from the 90s. And I noticed the ferritin didn't correlate very well and there were zero calcification with high ferritins. It was, it was kind of more randomized. The triglyceride to HDL and the ratios correlated well with the calcification as expected. And the HbA1c was pretty good. But I've wondered from small pieces of data over the years, can certain people have a high ferritin and yet it really is sequestered safely and they're managing it without any deleterious effects. But I, I think in theory that that could be absolutely correct. Um, however, uh, I'll just bring up. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long on the left.